So I want to thank um, uh, the Builder Center and everyone uh, for attending here today, and of course the Builder Center and the staff of the Builder Center for uh, putting together this uh, round table um, discussion in such a quick time. I know that all of us uh, collectively and many uh, of our peers are uh, thinking or still reacting to the news uh, from last week about uh, the, sh the shifting uh, relations between the U.S. and Cuba. Uh, so my, uh, my area of research and my area of interest uh, in the Cuban economy has gradually my, uh, evolved to, uh, to two fields, right, to agriculture and the, the emerging private sector, primarily, you know, the micro-entrepreneurs or the micro-enterprises. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, agriculture and, uh, and, uh, and self-employment in Cuba. Before I do that, I wanted to share with you, I'm sure many of you have seen uh, documents or have read media reports that highlight the key components of, the, of what, I, what, what we call the, the updated U.S. policy approach. So uh, as it relates to agriculture and self-employment, there are four components here. Uh, the first one everybody knows is the, um, the expansion of travel, uh, authorized travel by U.S. citizens to Cuba, and they have 12 categories. I'm not going to go into the 12 categories, um, but what really caught my eye here is that uh, the, the, the position paper, uh, the fact sheet published by the White House uh, last week says that um, one of the reasons is to make it easier for Americans to help, you know, the Cuban emerging sector, the, the non-state emerging sector. Right, so to make it easier for Americans to provide business training for, uh, training for Cuban private businesses and small farmers and to support the, the emerging Cuban sector, right, the, the private sector. Okay, so that's, a, that's the first provision. The second one that I found interesting is facilitating remittances. As you know, uh, right now legally, um, people who can send remittances to Cuba can only send up to $500 every three months. That's, those are the legal provisions. So those legal provisions will be increased to $2,000 per quarter. Now, as a side note, I'll tell you that everybody here who's familiar with remittances to Cuba uh, knows that they're the, the mulas, right, the, um, the, the informal carriers who take a much larger amount of cash remittances and in-kind remittances to Cuba. Uh, so the third provision here, of course, in terms of remittances, we're talking about the licensing and so on. The third one also caught my eye because explicitly the U.S. government is saying that they're seeking to expand commercial sales and exports of, uh, of goods, of certain goods, from the United States uh, to Cuba. Yeah. Okay. So um, that would be the third one. And, and uh, the objective there is basically to increase um, the, uh, the access of, of these resources, construction materials for, uh, you know, for private home construction, and for goods and so on. So it seems that, that the U.S. government looked at the reforms in Cuba or at the transformations uh, in Cuba in terms of construction and self-employment and so on, and they're responding to that. And then finally, facilitating uh, transactions between the U.S. and Cuba, the whole business of correspondent banking. Uh, prior to coming to academia, I spent over 12 years working on Wall Street, uh, and I did a lot of work in Latin America and in the Caribbean with, with correspondent banking and investment banking firms, you know, doing exactly what this is saying that uh, U.S. financial institutions will be allowed to do in Cuba. Um, one thing, a couple of things here, of course, on the consumer side, we have, um, we have debit cards and credit cards being used by travelers to Cuba and so on. But... In essence, if you read about it, it says that um, these measures are designed to improve the efficiency and, and the accountability of payments, you know, authorized payments from the United States and Cuba. So with that background, I wanted to talk a little bit about agriculture. And the three things about Cuban agriculture that I want to say that are, that are fairly new, as you know, in the Builder Center, we've done a lot of work about agriculture. And in fact, we have done a lot of work of inviting Cuban experts on agriculture to come here to our conferences and, and you know, they're part of our publications and so on. But the, the first thing about Cuban agriculture that you'll notice is that um, even after the reforms, right, the output levels are declining. They continue to decline. And what I highlight in, on, on that first table there, it's basically the declines on the output level, but primarily in the state sector of agriculture. So you'll notice that um, Agricultural production is actually declining in the state sector, but it's actually improving in the non-state sector. 
And so uh, I have some of the breakdowns here uh, that I'm looking at. And so uh, you can see, for, for instance, if, if you break this down and, and, and you look at the state sector, um, citrus pr uh, production went down 76%. Rice production went down 20% in the state sector. Now, ironically, rice production for the entire country from 2008 to 2013 went up 56%. So you see a decline in agricultural production in the state sector, an increase in the non-state sector, although in some, in, in some, um, in some crops, uh, production in the non-state sector is also going down. You'll notice that some of those crops are actually the same crops that the United States under TESRA exports to Cuba. So there you see some of the, I'll, I'll talk later about the implications of that. So, so the first feature of Cuban agriculture is declining and, and a very uh, mixed trend of production between the state sector and the non-state sector, okay? The second feature or, or the second uh, element of the current situation of Cubans' uh, non-sugar agriculture is an immense amount of land that's idle. So about 17%, 16% of the land, of the arable land of the country, about a million hectares remains idle. And one of the problems here is the reluctance of the state cooperatives to basically declare the land that they have. So this is, this is basically an estimate based on a survey by the Ministry of Agriculture, right? So that the Ministry of Agriculture went and conducted a survey and they estimate about a million, 14,000 hectares that are um, that are declared. There's probably around 300,000 more that are undeclared. So my estimate is really about 1.3, 1.4 million hectares out of 6 million, uh, you know, out of 6.3 million hectares. Um, the other feature of the Cuban agricultural sector and, and how later, of course, I'm going to relate this to the, um, to, to the recent measures in the United States. It's basically, if you look at this table, you can see how fragmented the Cuban um, agricultural markets are. And what I wanted to show you here was the value of total sales in agricultural markets. Now, if you look at the, at the value of total sales in agricultural markets, it seems to contradict the data that I presented before. And it does, there's a contradiction. Because the value of total sales has increased. So when the value of sales increases and output goes down, what does that, what does that mean for the Cuban uh, agricultural sector? It means that prices are pretty high. It means that the, that, that the country is experiencing a high degree of agricultural inflation. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to tell you here is if you look at this data, um, the, the state uh, operated, uh, they call it mercados agropecuarios de oferta y demanda. So these are, these are supply and demand quote unquote markets, but where um, state enterprises can sell their produce at free market prices. If you look at their at, at conditions um, in those markets, um, uh, the, the value of sales in those markets in 2014 are equal to 31% of what they were in 2013. And the reason for that is because prices have gone up so much in those markets that, you know, consumers are moving on to other segments of the agricultural market. I studied agriculture in detail um, in Cuba and in other parts of the world, and I haven't found any other place in the world that has such degree of segmentation in the agricultural sector. So there will be implications, I think, um, in terms of the, the structure of the agricultural market. So the final couple of points I wanted to make here is, if you look at the data for 2014, you'll notice some new players. The cooperativas no agropecuarias. Okay, you'll notice that the cooperativas no agropecuarias um, are basically increasing the value of their sales. The same thing with the, with the puntos de ventas. The puntos de ventas are, um, are basically, you know, agricultural markets uh, on, the, on, on the side of the roads and things like that. So my point about this is that you have other players and so on. Uh, so here I show you the segmentation of the agricultural markets um, by, by the destination of sales, of the volume of sales. The other area that I wanted to briefly talk about was self-employment. Look at the look at the growth uh, of self-employment in Cuba. Um, just a couple of things about this, this data that you're seeing here. Um, the numbers that you're seeing here are numbers about the number of self-employed workers, not the number of licenses. So, so the number of licenses fluctuates. It's, it's very different than the number of self-employed workers. So one trend that I noticed is that from 2011 to 2013, and I also have data for 2014. 
but it's not official data yet, um, the numbers have leveled off. So, so there seems to be a cap on the number of self-employed workers. And so here on this table, I show you uh, the growth rate of self-employment. And, and uh, rather quickly, if you look at self-employment um, or employment in total, employment in the state sector is going down. Employment in the, in the non-state sector is going up. But at the bottom of this table three, you'll see the, the, the incredible growth rate, the, the very significant growth rate of self-employed workers, which increased by 206% um, between 2007 and 2013. So with all this data in, uh, in, in the background, um, what, what are the prospects, right? What are the implications? So when I thought about agriculture and the experience of other nations, uh, other countries that have gone through somewhat similar experiences like Cuba, uh, I thought about a couple of things here. And so one of them is decreases in physical output. I think that opening agricultural trade or increasing agricultural trade, even if it's one-way trade between the United States and Cuba, will actually have a negative impact on physical output in many of the of the crops that are produced in Cuba, particularly the ones that represent a large percentage of the total imports from the United States and uh, the ones that, uh, you know, the crops that this country, the United States, has a comparative advantage on. The second thing that I think will happen is, you know, I call it a realignment of the Cuban non-sugar agricultural sector. And so you have an increase in the reforms, um, you have uh, the elimination of food rationing, consolidation of our, of our agricultural markets. We talked about agricultural markets before, and I showed you how fragmented these markets are. So I, I think that that's going to uh, end um, in the future as more trade happens between Cuba and the United States. Um, the expansion of usufructo, I'm going through this rather quickly in the interest of time. So the expansion of microcredit programs and the reduction, and this already has been announced by the Cuban government, the reduction of the percentage of output that producers have to uh, sell to the state. So we have all these potential uh, impact. Um, then I thought about you know, self-employment, and I'll finish with this here. And uh, so one, you know, one of the effects will be an increase, of course, in self-employment activities, uh, opening self-employment to uh, foreign investment, and, and I think it's already what the Cuban government is also pointing at, which is increasing the participation of self-employment in the, in the economy, um, and employment, GDP, and so forth and so on. So, um, but this is one of the few times that I make a, you know, a presentation here where I'm looking at my conclusions and I, I have to say my conclusions are inconclusive because I think there will be more to add to that list, to, to, to the list for agriculture and to, uh, to the list for self-employment. And then so I look forward to interacting with you later and, uh, and getting some thoughts about uh, your overall impressions about you know, how these um, changes in US policy will impact agricultural trade and self-employment in Cuba. Thank you. Mario, one question, just clarification, because we don't have a whole lot of time and we have different people saying different things, it's a round table. So on a short term basis, what do you think the impact will be in, let's say within the next two years or, or less? In, in terms of, um, thank you. In terms of agriculture, I, I think output in many areas uh, will, will decline. Um, but also the return of rice exports from the United States to Cuba. And I wanted to, um, let me answer that with some numbers really briefly, okay? Um, in 2002, exports, sales of, of rice from the US to Cuba, direct sales were about $6.3 million. In 2006, $39 million. By 2008, it went down back, it went back down to $6.9 million. And then from 2009 to 2013, they disappeared. <laughs> So the, uh, the reason for that is Vietnam. Cuba went into a bilateral, tra enter a bilateral trade agreement with Vietnam, um, and Vietnam gave Cuba credit to purchase Vietnamese rice. So now, one potential impact is the increase of, of, of rice imports from the United States, because we know that in the world, Cuba is one of the largest consumers of, of rice per capita, right? But uh, domestic production is unable to meet domestic demand. So, so that's one. Um, in terms of agriculture, I think that will be a very significant change. Also, a restructuring of agricultural sales, of, of the 
of the composition of agricultural sales from this country to Cuba. Uh, and of course, a realignment of Cuban agriculture as a consequence of that. Um, so definitely um, a major impact on, on production, a major impact on prices, and, and of course a major impact on employment in the agricultural sector. Which, by the way, officially, agriculture only accounts for 4% of GDP in Cuba. But if you really do the calculations of the multiplier effect, it's about a quarter percent of GDP, the indirect effect. So it's a very significant sector of our economy. We'll be going back to many of these issues. I think we want to proceed now with uh, Hillary Becker, who is a very unusual Canadian, very friendly to Cuba. He studied his PhD in Cuba. And uh, he's, uh, he knows a lot about tourism, has been studying tourism for a number of years. And he's an accountant at Carleton University in, uh, in Canada. And uh, we wish him well in that new position as assistant professor. And we uh, care deeply and we uh, follow his work on Cuba. So you, you travel to Cuba extensively. You have first-hand knowledge. Let's tell us what's going on in terms of tourism. Um, I've been traveling there for about 15 years, uh, probably 70 70 plus trips uh, down to Cuba. I, everybody here okay? Um, I, I've uh, worked with most of the industries, so I've worked with the Ministry of Sugar, uh, the Ministry of Basic Light Industry, um, mostly with the Ministry of Tourism, Ministry of Finance and Prices, working on their taxation system. Uh, I've consulted with the, with the government, uh, with um, Indair, um, where I started boxing, and with the, the Cuban boxers, that was interesting. Um, Students wanted to see a pay-per-view. <laughs> but um, no, there's, there's lots of things that are going on. And so I've, I've been working with them quite extensively. Uh, written a number of papers over the years, uh, presented here, thankfully, um, uh, to, to Mauricio for that. And um, so what I'm going to be talking about here today is on the uh, sort of the opportunities and threats related to what's been going on. Um, over the last couple of days since the, since the announcement by Obama, uh, I've been on BNN uh, and seven radio interviews, so it's been a, a very trying and busy time. Actually decided finally that I could come down here last night, um, went to bed at one, got up at three, and made this presentation. Well, so. <laughs> So uh, I'm going to be covering a number of different things. I'll skip over because I, I did a, a very wide range of, um, of topics. Uh, so I'll speak, or strictly speak about the, uh, the, the tourism aspect. Um, but you know, some of these things have been going on for more than 15 years. So over half of the U.S. governors have visited Cuba uh, or gone to Cancun with uh, groups of businessmen. Uh, the discussions, I think that Canada was, uh, was particularly involved because of the respect issue. Uh, they're, they're great trading partners with both the U.S. and with Cuba. Uh, the, the Pope, um, you know, uh, was also involved in these discussions. And now you make sense of why uh, you saw Obama and Man at Mandela's funeral, Obama and Castro shaking hands, the handshake heard around the world, because uh, these, these discussions were going on at that time. So in the, the, the tourism industry, we see that... Um, you know, there, there could be advantages here uh, to, to all the Caribbean, because I'm going to be talking about those, uh, the other countries as well, because a rising tide rises, raises all boats. So the interest in Cuban tourism, we're going to see an increase in all the different countries. But the, the estimation has been that there will be about 3 million tourists coming from, uh, from the U.S. in the first year that the embargo is lifted. It's going to be mostly a curiosity and cultural tourism, uh, I mean, the cultural tourism from the everything from the Bay of Pigs to, you know, Fidel Shea, the cigars. Um, I suspect that with the increased demand, we will see an increase in pricing in tourism. In Canada, it's still a very cheap place to go. I can travel for under $1,000 for a week down to Cuba. Um, that Those prices will be increasing. It's, it's much more expensive for Americans to travel down there. <laughs> Uh, but Cuba does have a, I've worked um, with the Ministry of Tourism, and they do have a 20-year plan that they're implementing. Uh, just as an example, um, in Veradero, there is the, the discussions and the plan for uh, building a second power plant, the expansion of the, the entrance into to Veradero. New hotels will be going right through to the airport, uh, which will take part of the, um, part of the, ex the, the planned expansion that we're, we're going to be seeing. 
including in the, the a lot of the marinas are being expanded. Um, there's 500 new berths uh, that are being uh, built for the the um, uh, the yachts and the boats that'll be coming down, including some of the super uh, yachts. So some of the berths for those. But the one thing is that unlike the 70s, it is going to be a sustainable tourism. I have worked with the World Wildlife Fund uh, on sustainable tourism in Cuba and developing ecotourism products. Um, but working with SEPMA, that was something that didn't happen in the 70s, and Veradero is no longer a virgin beach as a result of the, uh, of the improper uh, planning that took place during that time period. But um, surprisingly, when people talk about you know, where are the expansion's going to be, uh, we are going to see mostly, I'm going to talk about uh, the, the cruise in a second, but uh, surprisingly, like diving and fishing. Uh, the reason I mentioned fishing is that it is a, in the States, it's a $115 billion industry. If you go down to Florida, people go bass, bass crazy on the, the, the fishing down there. Then you get into the, the Bahamas, and it's bone fishing. You've got the sail fishing, and that's a very, very large uh, industry within the, within the Bahamas. So Cuba has, uh, there was five American fishermen went down. They fished for five days, they caught a thousand bass, and they missed the world record by a half a pound in bass fishing. You've got the, the Hemingway experience in the north, and the entire south through the, the Bay of Pigs area, Santa Gazpata, is perfect for bone fishing. So that is a, a potential major area that uh, could be expanded, including the diving as well. But cruise tourism is going to be the big, the, the, the big potential here. Only 10% come in right now, but if you look at uh, Puerto Rico, is around, um, is around uh, a third, and Bahamas is about two-thirds of their tourists come by, come by cruise ships. So there's a, there is a very large potential for cruise ship tourism and the, the dollars that the, the tourists leave as they go through that. So Havana will be part of the, uh, the western routes uh, for, for cruise tourism going forward. Um, the other thing is, uh, as, you, as you know, with the, um, uh, with the ease of the travel restrictions, that Americans are now the number two tourist group, the Cuban Americans. But it's a different type of tourism. We've written a couple of papers on this. Um, the, the American, uh, the, the Cuban tourism, they don't want the five-star hotels. They're going to be staying in Casa Particulars, eating at Paladars, taking their families to Veradero and, and doing that sort of tourism. So it is a different type of tourism that we're seeing. Uh, healthcare is another area. I'm just going to touch briefly on that. The interesting component here is in 2013, for the first time, there was empty spots in the University of Havana Medical School. They couldn't fill the spots because Venezuela was running into issues and the, the sort of the Doctors for Oil program, um, they were going to be stopped or looking at um, reducing that so that the Cuban doctors couldn't travel to get the, the foreign money anymore. Um, I also was on BNN just recently um, after this announcement, the Business News Network, and um, there's an organization, Share It, is very large down in Cuba. They're in the mining and oil industry. But there's going to be huge opportunities for those companies which are in, that are working in Cuba right now because they'll be able to sell their product to the states. Um, they're also going to be able to buy machinery from the states. But the big thing is going to be investors. So they're going to be able to get American investors, which will increase the liquidity of their stocks. And we already saw, since the announcement was made, I bought share it the day that the announcement came out, and my shares have gone up about 50% so far. So there's been a huge increase in, in those. Um, basic and light industry, obviously the, um, the highly educated workforce. The Quinta Papistas is not really set up for professionals. That was something that I've been arguing with, um, arguing for a couple of years. Um, and that, that's an issue that, uh, that has to be dealt with. The Mariel Harbor, the expansion, $900 million. They're going to be able to, when it's fulfilled, uh, 1 million containers can pass through there, which means goods traveling to the states and back and forth. But they're also going to be able to compete against um, the other shipping ports, such as Panama, uh, down, through the, um, down through the Caribbean. I'll skip over the agriculture. Um, but one of the things is in the frozen orange juice and grapefruit markets, uh, they, they, the oranges in Cuba cannot compete with the navel oranges in, in Florida, but the frozen orange juice market is a very large market. And those oranges are perfect for that, that type of market. And they don't get the frost that wipes out the, the crop in Florida every couple of years. As far as the, the threats, um, you know, it's the shiny new toy syndrome. You know, it's the, the, it's the shiny new toy for Americans to play with. Uh, for investors, it's going to be a first mover advantage into those areas, if you think from a strategic business standpoint. And um, 
that's going to lead to a lot of foreign direct investment and the interest. The, the returns are going to be much higher. You're already hearing about uh, companies, uh, tourism companies in the Bahamas, which are buying out um, uh, Cuban properties because they, the Bahamas, well, one of the problems is that they're not really, uh, they're not really well equipped to deal with at least the perception for businesses in the Bahamas. So as far as the, the foreign direct investment going into the Bahamas is going to be an issue. Uh, as I mentioned, the the tour, the t cruise tourism, it's a 2.27 billion dollar business in the Caribbean. 70% of all cruises take place in the Caribbean globally. Um, there's going to be a loss of FDI and infrastructure to the Bahamas. I said the loss of the fishing industry uh, is going to be something very serious. But really, it's going to be the Miami to Bahamas weekenders, similar to uh, the people from Las Ve or Los Angeles going to Las Vegas for the weekend. Rather than going to, to the Bahamas for the weekend, they'll fly down to, to Cuba. Um, so that's going to be that's going to be an issue there. And uh, as far as Florida, as long as the the, the dollars uh, stay the same, and I mean houses are still fairly reasonable. Uh, I mean they've they've gone up substantially. They probably quadrupled in the last two or three years in Cuba, but they're still reasonably priced compared to other properties. Hundred hundred and fifty thousand dollars for something on the beach. Uh, but as long as they remain competitive, um, winter snowbirds that were going to Florida could now be going down to, to Cuba. Uh, as I mentioned, agriculture, the, the grapefruit season, for instance, is a different season to the U.S., so they could take advantage of that. But the fisheries is one of the big ones. Cuba produces three times as spiny lobster and twice as much as grouper and, um, and red snapper. So that's a potential loss um, to, to Florida. And then I mentioned... The, the response immediately that you saw from uh, Rubio and, and Bush is that you know, they're going to be potentially running in 2016. So it's interesting. My, my wife is Cuban, and um, watching her friends talk back and forth on, uh, on Facebook and that, it's about a 50-50 split. OK, thank you. All right. I have a, I have a uh... So you, me, you live in Canada, and therefore Canada, you know a lot about Canada. And we know that Canada hosted eight of the nine meetings or so, or seven. And we know that uh, they're endorsing many of the steps that were taken by the U.S. authorities. And they, are in, they have investments in Cuba. The question I would ask to ask you to face a follow-up is, what is the general tone in, in Canada in relation to the success of the U.S. initiative, the Obama initiative? Will it succeed in moving forward and in the, in the Canadian view, and therefore make a, a dent in on the embargo, more or less. Uh, the the well, basically in Canada, the the worry is that we have to get in there quickly. So we, it, we you guys, we as Canadians have to get in there quickly. We have to get entrenched. Uh, I mean, Cuba, Canada has been a very good friend to Cuba, and um, you know those relationships. And you know the Cuban businesses are very relationship orientated. So there is uh, there is that respect aspect. Um, so the, the Canadian businesses that are, that are in there are looking forward to being able to expand, as I mentioned, like share it, being able to expand into the U.S., uh, sell their product into the U.S., get the machinery, which will be cheaper, uh, and the, uh, the increased liquidity for their stock, but also that will reduce down their cost of capital and be able to expand. Um, we should be able to see an increase in telecommunications and other areas for them. So for Canadian businesses, and for Cana the Canadian businesses are happy to see this. We're seeing, uh, I said, a spike in virtually every single um, uh, stock market that deals with Cuba. Uh, there, there's one general stock, uh, ZEO. I can't remember what the, the actual name is. Uh, but I bought that one as well, and that's up about 25% over the last couple of days. Um, so we're, we're seeing an increase uh, potential there. The Canadian tourists, which is what I was on seven radio shows across Canada, um, the, the tourists are all worried that the prices are going to skyrocket. And they, they should go up to the rest of the Caribbean, but it's still, right now, it's the cheapest place for, for Canadians to travel. So you guys are afraid of the U.S., That's which means you're optimistic about... Uh, everything except hockey. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the, uh, right, we're gonna, we are going to return later to some of these questions, but and now we want to proceed with uh, Albert Laguna, who is uh, at Yale University and studying Cuban migration and cultural exchange. Albert. Yes, um, thank you all for coming in the midst of the holiday season. 
Thanks to my um, much better dressed colleagues for, uh, for having me today on the, on the panel. Um, my work is on the Cuban diaspora, particularly the evolution of the Cuban diaspora through the lens of popular culture. I'm writing a book on, on this topic, specifically through the lens of humor, Cuban choteo, right? So we're gonna, be, we're gonna see a shift now to my work, which is you know, considerably um, fewer numbers involved. Um, uh, so I want to talk about two, two issues. The first is one that's kind of flying under the radar, that kind of undergirds um, the reaction stateside, and that is the Cuban Adjustment Act. So like why Cubans are here in the first place, right? Um, and right away, when you see the reaction on the, on the media, you, you see um, the media focus goes to Versailles, right? The famous Cuban restaurant in Little Havana, right? At one point, there were more news vans than actual Cubans protesting at Versailles, right? But that's where you go if, you're, if you work for CNN, you get your news bite, your sound bite from Versailles. And uh, you, know, you, you got that, the exile and transigence. I would argue that you'd get a more um, representative sample of feelings in the Cuban uh, diaspora in, in the United States if you went to Hialeah. Hialeah is the most densely populated um, uh, city for Cubans in, in the United States. And most of those are um, more recent arrivals uh, from Cuba who actually want more engagement, more relations, right? The, the polls all say the same thing. Again, what no one has really taken up is how and why um, Cubans are here in the first place. And the, again, that underlying factor is the Cuban Adjustment Act of 1966. So a quick, um, quick, uh, quick update for those of you who uh, uh, might, have get, might have gotten lost in all this. The Cuban Adjustment Act passed in 1966 by Lyndon B. Johnson and basically gives Cubans who arrived to the United States, they put the dry foot on dry land um, residency after a year and a day of being in the United States, right? This is, no other group has it this good, right? You can get residency in a year and a day. Um, it was established during the height of the Cold War, right? So we need to establish a safe haven for these Cubans fleeing the, the quote-unquote communist menace, right, of Cold War discourse. And um, the Cuban Adjustment Act was central to kind of the exile identity, right? The idea that you couldn't go back, that you, didn't, you weren't a migrant, right? You were an exile, right, because you left for political reasons. They didn't want to leave. They had to leave. But the truth is, especially since the, the 90s, Cuban, to the, Cuban migration to the U.S. has been spurred by economic hardship. Exile suggests that return is difficult, if not impossible. Newer arrivals since the 1990s returned frequently. High is, they're the highest source of remittances, they maintain kinship networks, and keep connections to Cuba very much alive. In 2014, the numbers still aren't um, uh, uh, in concrete yet, but I imagine over 600,000 visits from the US to Cuba, most of those are, are Cuban Americans, Cubans based in the United States. That's a massive shift, right? And it's been, it's been growing every year um, since, since the 90s. Um, it's, it's not uncommon to hear now stories of people sending their kids to Cuba for the summer, right? And you hear that in the context of you know, Mexicans, yeah, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, but now in the case of Cubans. This is brand new, right? Something that I saw the other day, you can even pay for salon services in Miami, right, for someone who's in Cuba. So Tia Cuca is going to get married, right, in Cuba, and she wants to get her hair done, right, but she can't afford it. So you can pay some, if you live in Miami and you're her relative, you can pay someone in Miami who serves as the intermediary for the services done in Cuba, right? This is the kind of, of fluidity that we're seeing um, lately, right? But the question is, if the Cuban Adjustment Act was born out of Cold War hostilities between Cuba and the US, then it stands to reason that if diplomatic relations um, are set up and overt hostilities, overt hostilities are in fact no more, that you get away, you get rid of the, the Cuban Adjustment Act. So my question is, what is the future of the Cuban Adjustment Act? Um, Cubans across generational cohorts, from those who arrived early on in the, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, um, to the more recent arrivals support the Cuban Adjustment Act. The latest FIU poll showed over 80% supported it. For the slight majority of the older generation of exiles, the repeal of the Cuban Adjustment Act would run counter to a founding principle of the Cuban exile community. We are special. The Cuban Adjustment Act is necessary because of the tyranny of the Cuban government in Havana. The act represents opposition to that government. Again, what happens when we have diplomatic relations? that argument begins to, to fall apart, and it's already in shambles. Uh, 
More recent arrivals support the Cuban Adjustment Act because they have most recently benefited and have families and friends on the island vividly in mind as potential beneficiaries in the future. Um, Marco Rubio kind of touched on the Cuban Adjustment Act last year. There was some talk about re-examining, that was the word he used, re-examining, because you have to tread lightly on this issue. But since then, you haven't really heard much. So I, I'd invite you to keep an eye open, right? So what happens now with the Cuban Adjustment Act? Um, just to give you a sense, between 2005 and 2014, 118,000 Cubans um, came to the United States, to Mexico and Canada. Right? That's so 118,000. That doesn't even count the people who are coming through visas legally, through the, through the interest section. People who went through Mexico, through Canada, right? Dry foot in the United States, right? What I'm going to keep an eye on is the writing is on the wall in Cuba, right? Diplomatic relations are going to resume. Is that going to cause an increased exodus of Cubans trying to get to the United States, knowing that this, this Cuban Adjustment Act might be in trouble? Right? So that's something to definitely um, keep an eye on. And I'm look, I can talk more about this uh, in, in the Q&A, and just, I can, I'm happy to serve as the point person for the Cubans over here. Right? Now the second thing I want to talk about, and this is more in line with my, my current research, is the intensification of cultural exchange between the Cuban diaspora and the island. With last week's news, most people are talking about renewed relations and a closer connection to Cuba. But the reality within the contemporary Cuban diaspora is that those connections are already quite strong. Right? And I want to bring that to your attention and think together about how this might change uh, with the new news. Um, I always like to tell this anecdote. In 1999, some of you may remember, Los Bang Bang visited Miami and people threw rocks at them, tomatoes, yelled obscenities. Um, and that's the kind of image we have of the Cuban exile community, right? Less than 10 years later, you have comedians and artists on the island, living on the island, traveling to Miami and hosting television shows. Television shows, right? That are just, everyone can watch. You have these, they, everyone knows they're living in Cuba, right? They don't, they don't criticize the regime and they come and they're hosting shows. You have this massive shift, right? And, um, this is kind of what I'm looking at right now, this movement of transnational popular culture. And I want to show you a video to give you a sense, right, of how things have changed, right? Give you a little taste. Um, the video I'm going to show you was created to promote a comedy music show, kind of variety show spectacular in 2013 in Miami. And it featured three acts. Robert Dico, a popular comedian in Cuba today. Gente de Sona, an internationally known Cuban music group also based on the island, Bailando, for those of you into the pop music. Um, and Los Peachy Boys, who create um, these, they're Cuban Americans, they live in Miami, they create these satirical videos about um, uh, being Cuban in the United States, right? And they perform together, Cubans on the island and Cubans in the United States for this huge show in the James L. Knight Center, capacity 5,000 people, they sold it out, and they created this video to kind of, um, as promotion, right? So the premise of the video, the premise of the video is that Robertico and Los Pichi Boys are in Miami, they're planning the show, but Gente de Sona are in Cuba, right? And they need information from Gente de Sona to plan the show. So that's your, that's your setup. So you get the sense. He goes to Havana, right? They tell him and he goes back. So this is why it's important to study popular culture, right? It gives you a sense of the kind of the texture of how people are imagining relationships between Cuba, the diaspora, and, um, and, uh, and the United States, right? Um, there's, this fluidity is definitely uh, at work. Um, 
We usually think of material going one way, right? Remittances, migrants send back to the homeland. But here we have something different, right? It's the homeland sending something to um, the diaspora. And you're seeing a lot more of that um, in Cuban popular culture. Um, and I have a ton more examples of this, this exchange. I was recently in Miami two weeks ago where um, some of you may know the show Sabadazo. It was very, very popular show in Cuba in the 90s, right? Hugely popular in the 90s. And half the cast lives in Cuba and half the, half the cast works in Miami. And they came together for a reunion show in Miami and they sold out the house, right? They completely sold it out. Um, so Robertico and Gente de Sona um, are very popular in Miami, right? Based in Cuba, very popular in Miami. The PG Boys, live in Miami, but are extremely popular on the island, right? So you might ask, how is that? They're, they're circulating their material basically through YouTube. Everyone I met in Cuba knew the Peachy Boys of a certain age, right? So the question is how that's happening. And the answer is what I will now dub El Famoso Paquete, right? Because everyone has, a, has an opinion on El Famoso Paquete. For those of you who don't know what El Paquete is, Paquete translates to the package. And the package is one terabyte, this is an example, I have the weekly paquete in my possession here, um, a weekly um, package of one, th of one terabyte worth of data. That's a thousand gigabytes. That's a lot, a lot of space, right? And it includes movies, um, you can't see, it's, too, clo it's um, too far away here, the image, but it contains uh, series, movies, music, mostly from the United States, right? Um, the most popular show in Cuba is Caso Cerrado. Um, it's a courtroom drama, not drama, a courtroom, um, there's words I can use to describe it I won't use, but it's a kind of Judge Judy with Jerry Springer kind of mixed together, right? Um, and this is circulating every week. So if you're watching a, a, a show like Game of Thrones, very popular in HBO that comes out weekly, right? They have the episodes the week after, right? So people are keeping up. I was having conversations about the shows I watch that I keep in, uh, track of with people in Cuba, right? But also what's interesting is that Miami shows, Miami cultural production are very, very popular in Cuba. So people love Alexi Valdez, right? Alexi Valdez was a kind of comedian, very important personality in Cuba. He left, now has a show in Miami and people keep up with the show in Miami. You even have Alexi Valdez in his monologues saying hi to his audience in Cuba, right? So El Paquete, there's no internet in Cuba, right? So the Paquete circulates and people download this. Actually, it's a group of two guys. I could talk more about this in Q&A. Two, two gentlemen put together El Paquete. Right? They have this, this group of people who work for them that download stuff from the internet. People have access to high-speed internet and they circulate it around the island through these coludos, hard drives and pen drives. Um, and it's really revolutionized kind of entertainment um, and information in Cuba. Uh, it's important to point out that there is no critiques, overt critiques of the government on El Paquete. Right? The government allows it to happen, but you're not going to see Ioanni Sanchez on El Paquete. Right? But, yes. Oh yeah, of course. Um, is um, the, the Cuban government knows who these people are? You know, you can you can go so far. So you can have like co comic acts making fun of the government, but you can't have you know uh, a show from my, uh, Maria Elvira, right, in her show in Miami on El Paquete. That's not gonna happen, right? Um, and to give you a sense, um, you know, one thing I, I'd like to pose to my more economically inclined uh, colleagues here is that I'm, I'd go on a limb and suggest that. The consumption and sale of popular culture through Paquete is one of the most powerful and visible aspects of Raul's market reforms in Cuba, right? Visible, tangible, consumed, right? It's a part of the urban landscape in Cuba, right? So here you have Caso Cerrado, right? This is being sold uh, in the streets of, of Havana. And this is a small one. This is a small uh, kiosk. And this is just like Homeland, Korean soap operas, um, uh, shows from HBO, uh, soccer, baseball. It's, and these are like almost on every block. And I'm not just talking main streets. I'm talking like small little streets in, uh, in neighborhoods in Havana, right? So here you have Carlos Otero and Bonco Quinongo from Sabadazo. And they're now in Miami, right? Uh, next to a show that's very popular in Cuba now called Vivi del Cuento, right? So you have that kind of stuff existing simultaneously. And of course, I had to throw in, you know, the Willy collection, Willy Chirino uh, CDs are being sold um, uh, uh, throughout Cuba. Um, and the final thing I want to show you, I just, I just think it, you might not have had a chance to, to see this is, and keeping with the logic that this is a big part of 
how Cuba's, Cuba's market reforms are kind of playing out is the, the marketing aspect, right? So within the paquete, you have commercials for Cuban businesses, right? You're gonna love this, Mario, right? So here's a trailer for a movie I know nothing about. It's coming out in the United States, um, in the heart of the sea, right? That's not important. What's important is, watch the bottom of the screen. Must gave way to doubt. Hope to superstition. We were headed for the edge of sanity. So that's pretty sophisticated, right? They're embedding it, it's sophisticated. And the last one I'll show you is so these commercials are being embedded in U.S. cultural production, right? It's, it's fascinating. Um, the, the last one I'll show you is, where is Taulasos? Taulasos. Taulasos. Um, look at, this is incredible. This is absolutely incredible. This is a, a, a theme park, kids park in uh, San Antonio de los Pandas. Si busca divertirse en Cuba, Parque Abuelo Machungo, con maravillosas ofertas para todos. Alquiler de local con servicios para fiestas y cumpleaños, cafeterías, parque de diversiones y más. Estamos en San Antonio de los Baños, Artemisa. Disfrute en familia de misterios, deportes y juegos de todo tipo. Abuelo Machungo, el paraíso de los niños. Abuelo Machungo, Avenida 25 entre 76 y 78. There's, there's a dissertation right there, right? I mean, it's, it's incredible. Um, and these are just a few examples. It's all over the paquete, right? Um, I'll leave it there. Um, my sense is that with, with closer relations, opportunities for transnational uh, exchange are going to increase. But... Um, well, we see more of this kind of marketing as more money is, genera is generated from abroad of remittances, right? As you can, you can send more money now. Um, and more money being generated within the island is going to increase. Obviously, it's still, um, it's still tough to put uh, uh, signs up, but this is proliferating through El Paquete, the most consumed form of cultural production in Cuba at the moment. Um, uh, finally, will there be a crackdown? This is piracy. <laughs> this, is, this is a terabyte worth of privacy. Piracy. What happens when uh, uh, they get to talking and, and U.S. studios are saying, uh, we can't have this anymore, will there be a crackdown? My cousin told me in October when I was in Cuba, um, uh, she used um, other words, but basically the paraphrase, we're screwed if, if the embargo ever falls because Cuban TV is terrible. <laughs> and that's true. Everybody, the, the critique is Cuban television is, is absolutely terrible. Um, so... Uh, I'll leave it there and happy to entertain questions. Thank you. So Albert, part of what I hear, I think I hear you saying that a normalization official one is not really needed for cultural exchange. It's already going on, it's, it's pretty strong. Oh yeah, that, that's kind of what I wanted to, to I know, that, plan the idea, yeah, absolutely. That this is, it's already happening. It's already happening. It's already happening and um, that's what the, the news is kind of missing, that oh, now it's going to happen, but it's, it's happening on a kind of individual and in a kind of community level, um, yeah, for years. But all things considered, do you think normalization as proposed will enhance, further enhance cultural exchange or not? Sure, yeah, absolutely. And there's already things happening for, right now, everyone is trying to get people who are interested in traveling to the United States, the five-year visa. Right, so that you can go in and out of the United States for five years without having to reapply. It cuts, it cuts down on the, the wait time at the embassy. They're, they're flooded. Um, uh, so you're starting to see a lot of that. So you have these comedians, Robert Tico. I'm, I'm not kidding. He's here almost every month. He comes and goes like it's like he's got his own little personal boat going back and forth. It's incredible. It's incredible. I think I, you implied or you say and you, you pretty much stated that uh, the connection, the exchange, 
is an industry that it makes money and Absolutely. it shares in the, both in the island and Miami, both. On both sides. So you have um, TV stations in Miami paying, um, you know, paying because the embargo you're not allowed to pay, um, uh, people to write shows for, for television in Miami, right? You have these comedians who are, who are being brought over. The, the money is fronted by businesses in Miami to bring over someone like Robertico or Pamphilo, right, to perform at their club, right? So there's, there's money going both ways. It's, it's um, definitely going both ways. And uh, then we'll take some comments for you and questions and answers. Again, we have an event on April, no, Mar, uh, Febrero, no? Febrero. We have a follow-up roundtable on February 27th at 4 p.m., so we look forward to your ideas, what kind of questions you'd like us to address, and uh, what kind of issues you find more interesting, and we will take those into consideration. We will be scheduling three or four events next year. We think this is a, one of the most important questions at the time regarding Cuba, and we mean to uh, stay with this for quite a while. Uh, with, uh, the, you know, using the tremendous resources in New York City, and you are all an ex uh, parts of that uh, richness that uh, makes dialogue on Cuba, the exchange in Cuba, so vital and interesting. I want to very, this is a, uh, you know, kind of long, I want to cut, it's going to be a little choppy, but I just want to, I don't have time to finish. But this is the IT connection, it, you know, IAT, uh, kind of communications, mutual uh, communications. I think the area of communications itself is in, is in discussion. And the question is, uh, what's, what's going to happen to the contact between Florida and Cuba? Uh, the big surprise, just reviewing basic things, you know, on uh, December 17th, the, the wonderful or very well documented story in the New York Times, nine meetings in eight of which were in Canada. By the way, did you what did the content of those meetings filter down to the leaders of Canada, to common Canadians? The content of those eight meetings, in, no. No, it, uh, it wasn't. It didn't go down to the the average even person. even now. There's no it's secretive. It's yeah, very secretive. Very secret. Uh, so Canada was very involved, even though it has a conservative prime minister, and uh, you, you took an Argentine uh, pope, divine intervention, who to sponsor this event, and it happened. And so you have a 45-minute conversation after 18 months of uh, talks, and that in itself is a great. Uh, the process leading to this uh, result is fascinating. We want to return to that next year. It's a historic agreement. I think the, the word is correct. It is perceived as such by any other international actors, the major actors, and the media. It will shape, it is shaping the process of reform actualization in Cuba. And above all, normalization is, as stated, is in itself a sea change, UN policy toward Cuba. In addition, it aims at lifting the embargo, which has been in place since 1960 and altered slightly in 61 and then later. But there are many questions again that, that are, are being, need to be asked. This was not the first attempt, attempt at normalization. There were, if you read the book by Leo Grant and, uh, and Kornblow, the, uh, on a back channel, you learned there were many, well, we knew this before. We had meetings here where we did in this very room with, with some of the policymakers that were part of these uh, initiatives in the 70s and 80s and 90s to uh, normalize relations with Cuba. And nothing happened, in part because Cuban, at the time, there was a, some disinterest on, on the part of Cuban authorities, just the interactions, uh, and we can go back to those issues. So this is really not new, so we need to ask ourselves, well, is this going to succeed now? The embargo started way back. Uh, Kennedy was involved in this whole sequence of events, Bay of Pig 61, Missile Crisis uh, 1962, called Cold War. Uh, Cuba survived not only the fall of so Soviet style socialism in spite of all this, but it also survived the hardening of the embargo in 1991, the Torricelli bill and the law that was, came out of that bill, and the Helmsmerton bill and the law came out of in 1996, which is the hardest, and indeed aims at overthrowing, at changing, regime changing Cuba directly in the language, and this is U.S.
law. This is this is a pretty strong. This is I think one of the things we may want to do next year is really take a reading at Helms Burden and the U.S. laws it stands in relation to what it uh, what it does to Cuba or what it intends to do. Fast forward to, to, to six and eight. Uh, Fidel Castro ill in 2006. Presidency goes to Raúl. Reform process. Barack Obama has been really in favor of contact negotiations. If you recall, since 2008, since the campaign. After 2012, in the re-election, he dispatched a team with uh, actually interesting. It was out of the White House. It was not the Department of State. We see two aides, Ricardo Zuniga and, ben and Benjamin Rhodes, who were authorized to conduct high-level conversations, and the Pope was part of this whole thing, and so on, so, as discussed. In nine meetings, the Pope encouraged, and then uh, on Tuesday, December, December 16th, 17th, no, the 16th, the, the conversation with Fidel Castro. The terms we all know, but it's good to review, is implied in the discussion before, a prisoner exchange, Restrictions on remittances will be lifted. We'll go from 500 every quarter to 2,000. Travel restrictions lifted in many areas. The internet access, release some some other jail prisoners in Cuba. Another another person who was also being released. Cuba will be taken out of the list of sponsors of terrorism, according to the, my understanding of the agreement. And a, a, we have promised the Cubans with the U.S. a new honest and serious debate on to lift the embargo, which of course requires congressional approval because it is a, it is a, it's a law. The agreement uh, contains uh, easing travel restrictions, including family visit, officials, official visits, journalists, professional, educational, and religious, as well as public performances. There are other agreements having to do with the kind of narcotics, environmental protection, and human trafficking. I want to go back at some point to environmental protection, which you know a lot about, Hillary, right? And I, I'm not so sure that I fully understand what, they, what the agreement intends to do about environmental protection, but uh, do, you, do you happen to know? I haven't seen specifically what, uh, what they've been discussing. I, mean, I think they just mentioned the word environmental, but the specifics are not out yet on many of these uh, points. What's next? Larger role for the Department of State. Now the action shifts to state and uh, John Kerry and uh, to Assistant Secretary Roberto Jacobson, who will, be, which, who will be in Havana next month, January, to talk about uh, migration, but also to, mainly to talk about this, this issue. Uh, there are other visits scheduled, including Secretary John Kerry said he would like to go to Cuba. Uh, the current, if this, if this thing moves along, as uh, people, many people hope it will, Ambassador Jeffrey De Laurentiis, who is a current rep in Havana, will be in charge of uh, charge affairs, charge of affairs, and pending confirmation as ambassador, either him or somebody else, and that's in itself interesting. Uh, so we know that, and some of those issues you may want to raise questions about some of this, some of these contents. And we know the context: Obama, his convictions and interests. I think we need. We do not know enough about. Uh, we know enough about his convictions, but not so much. Of, not as much about our U.S. interests and his own interests. We need to discuss that more later, probably. Or if you have any insights today, uh, clearly part of the context is the U.S. And this is part of what the president has been reflecting: the U.S. in global affairs, the rise of Asia, which accelerated in the last decade, Middle East a mess, which continues to really to sap the resources of the U.S. authorities, Russia, and then, uh, and then uh, as a result of all these challenges elsewhere in Europe, including now added to Middle East and uh, East Asia, and Asia we, have, we, we, know, we had the neglect of Latin America for many years, for over a decade, I would say. So now many parts of Latin America shifted to China. They embrace uh, more radical or more leftist or left-leaning anti-U.S. perhaps forms of Regionalism, and Mercosur uh, Alba, and actually we witnessed something tragic. I did because I was very interested in this summit of the Americas, and they really the last two failed because of the embargo issue being raised and dominating the discussions between South American and Latin American countries in general and the U.S. So Cuba, the Cuba issue was able to stand in the way of progress in many areas that are of vital interest, I would argue, to the U.S. and to those countries.
So we'll see if something changes. I think the U.S. has an abiding interest and part of the motivation in these Pacific countries as well as Brazil is South America, in other words, and uh, I think that's part of the reasons why for the normalization at this point, and we'll get back to that in just a second. Uh, the part of the shifting winds and is the international opposition to the embargo, which has not abated, is still as high or higher than it ever was. Latin American, Latin America and the Caribbean in particular oppose massively to, to the embargo. Uh, three reasons, dislike for, US, for hegemonic imposition on the part of the U.S., sympathy for the Cuban regime, so in some cases, and then the effectiveness of Cuban diplomacy and the Cuban actors or actors acting on behalf of the Cuban state. Uh, the Catholic Church supports the lifting of the embargo. It has done that for quite a while, and apparently is making it under Papa Francisco is making a, um, a stronger effort in that, in that direction. And then, of course, the U.S. is also reacting to China and Russia's initiatives, developing partnerships with Brazil and countries in, in the region, which is something to, something to, to, to be concerned about. So I think the U.S. has interests that have to do with inter international, global, uh, as well as political in the U.S. and so on and so forth. But uh, we'll, we'll save some of this for the, for the next year. In the U.S., public opinion, 60% or more, shifting against the embargo. Cuban Americans, the younger ones, shifting also not as much, but a uh, noticeable tendency, the Catholic Church in the U.S., the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Human Rights Watch, major agricultural interests, associations, and uh, Car Cargill wants to export goods to Cuba and other companies. And they are part of this uh, new coalition in the making, which is very interesting to see this evolve. Of course, there is a position in the U.S., and it's really formidable when you consider that Cuba has three senators. There's a Cuba caucus in the Senate, if you will, right, of uh, three highly articulate it's an amazing, 6% of the U.S. Senate, 6%. 6% is, is made up of Cuban Americans, three, three out of 50. <coughs> what? What? Is this him? Is this him? Is this him? So I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's just, it's three, it's 3%. See, I'm, I'm thinking there's 50 states, so it's three. But, very, but they count heavily. They are three very effective, very articulate. They really have, no, they really are. They have very effective uh, credentials. I mean, uh, you may, I do not happen, I happen not to agree, but I was reading about these credentials of these people. Ted Cruz had uh, graduated from Princeton, had uh, honors, and had a very interesting thesis in political science. And then he, he is another Harvard law degree, a Harvard graduate in law. Marco Rubio, University of Miami Law, and uh, uh, of course, Bob Menendez out of the uh, New Jersey Rutgers Law School and very successful politicians. These are three rocks to success stories, sons of immigrants, parents who came poor, who made it, and they were able to become very powerful and very effective uh, leaders of, of the, in, their, in their party. So I think this is something, to, something interesting. So I, I do see that uh, the debate in the U.S., led by these uh, three mosqueteros will, uh, will actually become more interesting and we'll have to watch that and see what happens. The reform process, uh, Cuban economy grew by one, it's really what Mario said is correct in agriculture and generally this year the projected figure is 1.3% growth. Last year it was more or less the same in the last two or three years, and then next year they're projecting four, four point something percent only because they're factoring in the uh, normal, normalization, correct? So that's, uh, that's, so in other words, the, the reform process is really not going well in Cuba. There are, and the, the reasons, the obstacles, there are policies that perhaps were not as effective, resistance from some sectors, and you also have structural reasons which, are, which are, we, are, we are working on. And one of them has to, do, has to do with demographics. Cuba has an aging population. The, uh, uh, the, the weight of seniors is increasing very fast. And, uh, and it, it, it is called the, what democracies call the dependency ratio. So Cuba does not have a young population. And uh, I'll, I'll say a couple more things about that in a second. Part of this drama is reflected in politics. It's generational, of course. Fidel is 88. 
not well, Raul is 83, and he's scheduled to pass the presidency in 2018. And other, other leaders in the same age, uh, are in the same age group, Ramiro Valdez and many others. Ramiro, yeah, but, uh, Machado Ventura and Andy Watlaga. So therefore what? <laughs> therefore, this is a passing of the torch in Cuba. This is part of the context, and in Cuba, clearly Cuba has reasons to, to do something different. Prospects, and I will simplify this because I have a boringly long list of topics here, which are, I don't want to follow the humor in, in Albert Laguna's presentation. I cannot compete with that, but essentially, we're talking about the writing of a new chapter uh, so it's, it's the turning of the page, indeed, it's a historic moment. Uh, in my view, and this is one of my main points, this will need to go fast, and I'm, I, I'm aware that many people disagree, would disagree with that, rather than slow. If, if it has to go fast, if it wants to endure and uh, it'll lead to deeper shift in U.S.-Cuba relations. Why? Timetable. Obama, Obama Raul, Bato, both have major events in 2015 and 2016. Uh, the 2015 is the Summit of the Americas that I alluded to and intensification of the economic policies in Cuba. 2016 is a, they just called for a the seventh meeting of Congress of the Communist Party of Cuba to decide uh, these issues, right? So presumably that will be a decisive, a, a decisive moment in terms of exactly what, which, which way Cuba goes. So the next two years, less than that, is, I think will be pretty intense in terms of what happened in Cuba, of this chapter. Um, as I mentioned, the U.S. wants to ensure, to cap wants to capitalize on this momentum in relation to the Summit of the Americas. It needs to realign relations with the region. It really does need to. I've been following that story for quite a while, and I do agree that the U.S. is in, in the U.S. vital interest to shift the tone of discussions in the region, and part of this may have to do with the timing, at least, with that, uh, that, that calculation, that calculus, that court calculation. Uh, there are many differences and to be worked out over national sovereignty and international policy, as Raul Castro pointed out. He left out uh, something that is vital in the minds of many Cubans, which is what to do, whether to intensify and how fast to intensify the market reforms and that's an alternative form of economic development. We'll have to watch that carefully and see how it goes. Uh, so the, the new chapter will center in Cuba and the resolution, I, I believe, even if partial, the lingering debate between reformers and the state is in Cuba. One of the reasons the reforms have not really moved as fast in Cuba as I and many others expected is that uh, you do have a sector in Cuban society that does not like the reforms. And Raul himself is the first one to acknowledge these uh, resistance, forms of resistance, but oh, they don't know what, they are, I'm not so sure that they, well, I think they know what to do now, but uh, we'll have to wait and see. So continued statism or more market, that's the issue. Well, I'm gonna move fast. I think Brazil is going to be a player. It is a player already. It's a major country, the largest in, the, in, the South, in Latin America, the largest in South America. It uh, has uh, Vice President Biden will visit Brazil next month. The, the, the Gilma Rousseff, the re-elected president of Brazil, will visit Washington in 2015. And I think Brazil is, a key, is seen by Washington and by many other players as a key actors in, in this whole thing. Brazil has uh, interest in Cuba, not material interest, investments in Mariel, sugar sector reforms, exports, it exports about $700 million to, uh, by the way, it competes with, uh, in terms of soy, it will have to compete with the U.S., uh, corn, and many other, so they will be, this, one of many of the same crops. It will be interesting to watch how this, this issue gets played out, worked out. And he wants to invest more. If, if, if Brazil can get its act together. In any case, Brazil is seen by the U.S., and I think it's, itself it it's, wants to play a larger role. I wouldn't, I wouldn't dismiss the idea of Brazil playing a key role. We have to watch the regional and the international uh, kind of arena to, to, to next year to see what, how this thing is heading. Uh, 
Uh, let me get, I'll make a last point and then just shut up. I mean, essentially, how do I simplify this? You have essentially two types of transitions. This, the, historically, assuming that Cuba is in a transition mode or a, or a process of reform that may lead to, trans, to transformation. The dual transitions of the Soviet Union and Central European East, uh, Central, uh, Central Eastern Sea, Central, Central, and Eastern Europe. <laughs> Central and Eastern Europe, Central and Eastern Europe, that are they all engage in some form or another of dual transition, democracy and market. It was big bang in both ways, or shock therapy, major collapse and then changes. And then uh, radical market policies, economic policies toward the market. And uh, of course, in many ways they failed and they did not work as, uh, including perhaps Russia, which led to a form of liberal democracy or something, if you want to call it that. Uh, and we are now paying the price for some of the problems that, uh, that took place there with the oligarchy in charge of uh, the economic oligarchy in terms of Russia. So do we want that in Cuba? Of course not. So the question is, is that an option for Cuba? No not shock therapy, I would argue strongly, and I would maintain that line in our own writings on Cuba. Therefore, Cuba would, is best off following a, 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 a China-Vietnamese model, a, a gradual liberalization. Many people have said that, but, but, uh, that model in, in, entails decentralization, which does not, has not happened in Cuba, gradual economic liberalization over many years, which is not happening in Cuba yet. Strong state control, they, that is Cuba, but no, no privatization uh, yet in Cuba at all, or too significant. I think the, main, the main issue here, and I don't wanna bore you with this, is that uh, shock therapy, when it works, to the, to the extent that it works, it, it needs entrepreneurial social forces, which Cuba lacks, that's my main point. Cuba does not really have a, a, an internal kind of source of entrepreneurship and with resources to apply it, and that's a major problem that is going to constrain what Cuba does. Uh, shock therapy, the fast liberalization induced problems in, in social kind of policy, social arena area, and Cuba, including the, the question of, sort of, of comp competition. Cuba lacks the ability to compete, and as Mario pointed out, and I, I think I would summarize part of what you're saying, in the same, and I would raise the same questions about uh, tourism. Do Cuban entrepreneurs in those areas have the resources, the wherewithal to compete with what's coming, Canadian, European, and the answer is no. So I worry, I think that's, a, that's you, we better keep that in mind. Normalization, if the embargo is lifted, even when, Cuban entrepreneurs will be facing now is very stiff com competition. I am not optimistic about a Cuban agriculture ability to compete with uh, Iowa and the mid Midwest. So we'll see how that plays out. Or the very, uh, we'll see how that plays out. So that's a problem. So another problem with the gradual or fast liberalization in Cuba is that Cuba, you know, this, both China and, and Vietnam had a, uh, had a lot of workers in agriculture. Cuba does not. And part of the reason it's not competitive with Cuba is that it does, lacks capacinado on, 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 agrarian producers able to, mat, to do what I just said, to, 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 to produce food for a transformational society. That's a major problem. In a, in a, even in a gradual transition. My point here, either Cuba put resources and the people who support Cuba put resources in training in a, a very fast, the entrepreneurs in agriculture and other areas, or they will be really facing tough competition in short and very shortly. Cuba also has too many workers in the public sector, 74% uh, until very recently. I mean, that's not the case with China and Vietnam when they, are, when they embrace these things. So Cuba really does not have the resources, and then I mentioned the aging of the population, not enough young people. So Cuba lacks major conditions to really implement a, trans, a, a transition. And perhaps that's another reason why, it's what I call structural obstacles to success in the, in the economic transition. <clears throat> 
So there are real dangers. I don't want to belabor the point. Uh, by the way, here is part of the, the problem. China, when it embraced the reforms in the 70s, it was able to enjoy the, in the first kind of a slope, slope, downward sloping curve on the right side. Q, that, that, what year was that? Well, it's 1970s at the peak. Oh, of the first, the first peak. That means that a lot, a lot of people were young because the bread is old, you know, the kind of blue is younger, younger generation. So they were tending, so, so, so that has shifted. Now you have a lot of, you growing uh, senior population, decreasing younger, but China was able to use for many years the demographic bonus, you a lot of young people. Cuba already passed that did not use its demographic bonus. It used it for armed forces and for other purposes. And it now facing a very fast growing, look at the curve in terms of aging and in terms of dependency. That's the number of people who depend on those who work to get uh, social benefits. Then that's 60% very soon will be in Cuba. Very soon, very, very soon. So we'll see, we'll see what I will. So in any case, I'm, I'm going to stop and give you a chance to. It's a challenge. It's a condition. It's factor shaping. All I'm saying is that Cuba faces serious, its own set of conditions which will shape whatever way it goes. And uh, I think we have reasons to think about these issues and perhaps propose answers in the, term, in, in the sense of discussions, debates, uh, and, and adopting effective responses to this. Uh, Cuba needs outside investment for both entrepreneurship, incubators, and by the way, that's something that perhaps the normalization can do, which is set universities and exchange activities to discuss how to do this correctly in terms of producing entrepreneurs, producing, uh, transforming the human capital that it has, which is really not entrepreneurial, into an entrepreneurial uh, effort. And then uh, working on the issues of economic integration, China was able to, and uh, so, but let me stop here because this is, uh, so in any case, I really, I'm optimistic, personally, you know, having watched Cuba and I'm watching Cuba for a long time. The, oh my gosh, I, love, I lost my main point. <laughs> I, I, I is optimistic, but uh, I think there are serious challenges ahead and we need to keep the discussion rolling and getting new ideas to make sense of this, this uh, process. It's a very exciting process. Again, this is the first of an, of an event, event of something that we, of a forum and a round table. We hope to have you on board more, a few more minutes today and then next year. We want to hear about your ideas, what you think we should be addressing. We don't claim to have an answer for these challenges that we think is going to be very pressing. I think Europe has to be part of this thing, Hugo. You study Europe, and Europe is very important to Cuba, and uh, there are many there are many issues that are will need to be addressed in the in the weeks and comes and years to come. So let me stop here. Thank you.